Hey, are we live now? There we go. All right, it's working now. I was doing this. Sorry, I'm late, guys. I was on here earlier. I'm using new software to use my camera, and uh, I was not seeing anything. So hopefully, everyone can see me now. Camille, um, Camille is my uh, my content manager, and she's kind of in the chat, um, getting questions for me. So Camille, if you can give me a verbal, if you can put in the the document you're making for me right now, if you can see and hear me, that would be great. Before we get going. But where's everybody uh, coming in from? I want to see where you guys are are at and uh, how you're dealing with all the stuff that's going on right now. You know, are you um, using this time to uh, work more on your website or your SEO or your email marketing, any of that kind of stuff? I want to know exactly what you're what you're up to. Um, we can see everything just perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Veronica. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Chelsea, Ontario. That's awesome. And Act Theater and Schools is from the UK. Troy's from Texas. Another Austin, Texas. Tom Love. Hey, Tom, you're from Florida. Awesome. All right, cool. So, yeah, let, drop it in the chat. I want to know where you guys are all, uh, what you guys are focusing on right now. Because obviously, um, or if possibly it's business as usual and you're, you're just as busy as you always were, I want to know that as well. So, and anyway, my my um, content manager, uh, Camille, has been grabbing your questions and they're going to be in this document. So I'm just going to get going here. Uh, Mental Mary's from Jersey. Hey, Mary. All right. So let's just go. Let's just get going here. I know that's what you guys came for. All right. Oh, and by the way, I should mention that, you know, anything here is fair game of anything I talk about on my channel, your websites, optimizing that, SEO, uh, digital marketing, Facebook ads, any of that kind of stuff. Keeping in mind, um, you know, I'm not really good for like technical troubleshooting. So if it's something with software, that's probably I'm probably not the guy to ask there. I have someone who takes care of that for me. But anyway, here we go. So the first question is from Javier Espinoza, and Javier says, "What's the best practice you recommend to get emails of leads from Instagram TV and Instagram Live using my own website?" Yeah, so if you're doing if you're going to be using Instagram TV and Instagram Live, what you have to do is basically find a way to direct those people to your website from Instagram. So, you know, Instagram TV is kind of cool. Not many people know this. You can it's one of the rare places on Instagram where you can actually put a real link to go back to your website. So, what I would recommend if you're going to do TV, I recommend, you know, making a, a full length video, you know, five to 10 minutes, like a YouTube style video, embedding that on your website, and then having a short snippet of that, maybe one minute or two minutes, put that as an Instagram TV. And then you get people to click the link to go watch the rest of it on your site. And then on your site, you would have some kind of an opt in form. Um, what I like to do on my site and my client sites is in the blog section. It's just built into the template of the blog that after every single, um, you know, after every post, there's a, a global just section to op have people opt in to your lead magnet. So that's what I would do. And for live, you know, basically you'll just, you would be doing kind of what I'm doing, um, answering people's questions or giving a behind the scenes look at something in your business. And then, you know, comment, dropping a few hints in there to go to your website for, you know, some kind of an offer. Maybe you've got a coupon that people can take advantage of. I know a lot of people are doing that kind of thing right now to drive more foot traffic. So, you know, drop, you know, if you want a coupon for, you know, a free pizza or half price pizza, go to this website and sign, you know, sign up with your email address and I'll email it to you right away. That should work pretty well. All right. Next question from Troy Casanova. Hey, Troy, which email campaign service do you use? Also, do you have an agency account for it? Or do you tell your clients to purchase their own account? Yeah, I definitely have my clients do their own uh, account. I don't really get in there managing it. I will help them uh, basically coming up with the emails, but I'm not I'm not someone who runs my clients marketing for them. I, I do have people I can recommend for that. And I usually just kind of pass those names along to my clients, but I use Drip. I'm glad you asked that question right now because Last week, first of all, Drip is a little expensive. You know, my email list is about fifteen thousand now, so it, I pay like two fifty a month for that, which is kind of expensive. Um, you can start off with fifty bucks a month, but I was looking into uh, ConvertKit because I've heard a lot of good things, 
and I tried ConvertKit. I was about to le I was about to make the leap over. I was importing all my emails and stuff, and I did a test, and I saw my email wound up in my Promotions tab. That's not where you want it. You want it in the primary email tab on people's Gmail. Otherwise, half the people aren't even going to see your emails. So while Drip is more expensive, I still recommend it based on that alone. So take it for what it's worth. ConvertKit was easy to use, but promotions. All right, um, so next one is from Sorrow Dog Training. Hey, uh, should I promote my online courses in today's market and situation? Yes, because you're in the dog training niche. What better time than to train your dog right now when you're at home, right? This is gonna be, first of all, I don't know how expensive your, your training program is, but keep in mind, not everybody is broke right now, right? Not everybody has been financially hit. So I know like there's a lot of doom and gloom all over the news and there are there is a lot of unemployment. There's a lot of, and we all feel it because we're small business owners, right? So, but not everybody's a small business owner. Some people are plugging along just fine, but, and they have the added benefit of being at home all day with their dog. So perfect, right? This is the time that they would want to, spend more time on that. So absolutely. Don't apologize for keeping selling and keeping marketing in these times. Um, you know, it's basically, if we stop doing all that, the economy will get even worse than it is. And it's important that we address what's going on. You know, like I have with a few different, I've done a few lives, um, really addressing it, letting people know that I'm in it with them, right? But then, there's still things to do. There's still work to be done. Do you still have dogs to train? So yeah, go for it. All right. Next one is from Tom Love. Hey, Tom. Love that name. It's like a, it's a great band name. All right. Um, what's the best way or format to do videos that will work across YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and other social media? And how long should they be? The best format to do videos that'll work across. Okay. So first of all, what I would recommend is not using the same video for all those things. Here's what I do. So, because um, YouTube videos are designed to be longer, people will stick around YouTube longer because they've come they they've come to basically you know eat lunch and sit down and watch some videos, whether it's entertainment or learning, whatever. Facebook is not that way at all. People are scrolling. People are just trying to find something that pops out at them. So for that reason, people watch much, much shorter on Facebook. They watch, you know, a minute is considered long on Facebook, whereas the average uh, session time on YouTube is like 45 minutes, which is kind of nuts. So what I would do is come up with the long form video for YouTube and uh, you're going to cut it into bite sized chunks. And then you can like what I do is I take my YouTube video, I cut out like maybe a, a good, the best minute that either that tells them why it's important to watch or um, gives a really kind of juicy, actionable piece of advice. And then that's a standalone clip for IGTV. You could also do it as a LinkedIn post. You could also do it on Facebook. So pick out out of a 10 minute video, maybe three one minute chunks and spread them around and see what works best. Because on LinkedIn, I like to do, you know, three different videos a week, um, you know, spaced out a few days apart. So hopefully that helps. All right, from Angie Harden. Hey, Angie. She says, what SEO tool do you use or recommend? Now, there's a lot of SEO tools. They come in different categories. One is keyword research. Um, I still mostly use KW Finder. I have a subscription for that. But if you want a free one, um, Neil Patel's got a good free tool called Uber Suggest. So just go there. It's free. You can find the keywords you want to use. Um, but in terms of what you might be asking is, Kind of SEO tools for your WordPress site. And I used to use Yoast. I think the whole world was using Yoast, but now I switched over to Rank Math. I find it to be uh, much better, much more all purpose. You can even do stuff with local SEO with that, which is awesome, uh, which was an you had to pay for with Yoast. So it's called Rank Math, and I think it's all free. That may change someday. So get on, get grandfathered in right now while you can. All right. Um, next one is from Window Designs, etc. by Marie Moradian. I don't know if I pronounced that right, Marie. Sorry. Uh, what do you think of an auto appointment on websites, Calendly versus Acuity? Um, okay, so I've only used Calendly, so I'm biased. I've never used Acuity, but I know people do. 
I I think I've seen it in action on other people's websites. If I'm unless I'm thinking of a different tool, but I whatever I've seen in, as the other tool felt a little less, um, you know, what's the the word? Just like I think Calendly looks really great and really kind of airy and light from a design standpoint. Whereas I think Acuity, I think it's that one, looks a little more kind of hardcore. I don't know if that, that's probably not the right word, but it looks a little more dated, I would say. So I like the look of Calendly. I love Calendly. Like that's how I make all of my appointments on my site. And I even have paid um, coaching calls, you know, for people who want to talk to me about their websites and stuff. And it's a paid thing. So all the, all I do is I input, um, I have it work with PayPal to where they have to pay for that session and it all gets done in the background. I don't, it didn't have to do a thing like other than tell Calendly up front what my availability is. And then as I add things to my calendar, like if I have a, I, I'd say a haircut, but I no, we're not, no one's getting haircuts for a while, right? But if you put that on there, then that blocks that off on your calendar and no one can book that time. So, um, but I, I assume you know that you're just asking which one I like better. I only know Calendly, sorry, but I like it a lot and it's good. And it's, uh, it's free up until a certain point. You know, I, I, I used the free one for quite a while and it was fine. All right. Moving right along to Peter Golub, Golubovich. I'm do totally butchering that one too. Sorry, Peter. How can I manage multiple Google business locations on Google from a single account? I've pinned 10 locations for my rent a car, but I need, need to manage each location separately. Um, so that's getting a little technical for me, but I think it's basically you have one account on Google My Business and then you just add separate locations. Um, and each location is basically its own listing. That's really all you need. You do not need to um, make different accounts, nor should you. That's not the way they want you to do it. Um, I pinned 10 locations for my rent a car. You need to manage each location separately. Yeah, I think... And if that means like you're doing it all separately, or if you have, you know, managers for each location, I think you can share access on an individual basis with each of them for them to manage it. No problem. All right. Next one from Emily site. Hey, Emily, building a website from scratch right now. Any templates or ideas how to get vision and copy across to a developer? Also looking at new email marketing integration, looking at Zoho now, any insight? So a few questions there. Uh, so you're basically wanting to know how to communicate to your developer what you want. Um, you know, that's that's a tough one because there there is software, but it's kind of meant for designers to do that. Um, so if you're just kind of a lay person or a business owner and not a designer, it might be hard for you to do that. So what I recommend is, I mean, this probably doesn't even help you right now, but that's why you want to get someone who is not just going to be asking you, hey, what do you want? Draw it out for me and I'll do it. You want someone who's going to have a more kind of prescriptive approach asking you what do you need as a business and then here's my plan for you based on my experience as a web you know web strategist basically um but other than that i mean there's there so i used to use a think it was called in vision app i n vision app and that was basically a way to like kind of do mock-ups and stuff, but it's a little, again, if you're not a designer, it's hard to know. What I would do is um, I would go on a, a site like uh, themeforest.com. It's a bunch of WordPress themes. Find the one or find a few that look more or less like you want. So you go to him and say, these are, this is what I'm going for, right? And then give him all your images and the fonts you like possibly and say, this is what I'm going for. Do something similar to this. It's probably the best way to go. Draw stuff out if you need anything specific. Um, there's no real elegant way of doing it. It's just, you know, draw it out in Canva, whatever you can do, which is a free online software for designing for non-designers. So that might be your best bet. Sorry, Emily. Um, all right. So the next one is from Pam Nice Sleep. Do you recommend YouTube live sessions over Instagram or Facebook live Q&A? Uh, yeah, it's totally different, Pam. So the way it depends on where your audience is. I've built my audience on YouTube because um, pe I want people who are going to be like looking to see how to do their own digital marketing and website stuff. Like that's my audience. And there's no real way to search for that on Facebook. So this is a much more kind of slam dunk for me to, to go on YouTube. Um, 
so when you do Instagram or Facebook live Q and A, first of all, if you're going to do Facebook, what you want to have is a group. Um, page reach is really low right now and it's getting lower all the time. So what you want to do is make sure you have a group and then that it's much more likely for those people to find your, uh, your, your live video from that point. So do that. But again, the only people that are ever going to find your live videos are people who already follow you, Instagram or Facebook, uh, YouTube. I think most people that see this video are it's because they follow me, but I think there's also a little bit of um, organic push out there that YouTube does. Like if, if YouTube knows that people watch videos like this, they might push it out to new people and I may, may get a few new people. So if you're new watching this, type in the comments. I'd be interested to know if anyone found me through this video. I bet very few people did, but all right. So uh, yeah, and YouTube, basically people will stick around a lot longer in, in general than Facebook. All right. Chicago in the in the house question. Nice. I don't where where are you in Chicago, Picnic City? Uh, she said uh, they say, "What do you think about billboard advertising, and how would you word it to drive traffic to websites?" I'm an event rental company. Uh, I'm not a fan of billboards, and here's why: it's basically you're not doing any kind of um, pinpointing of who is going to see your ad. It's, it's it's like I've had friends. I have a friend who's a realtor. Hope he's not watching right now. I'm gonna call him out, but he did a billboard, and I told him, I'm like, dude, like that is not the best spend of your money because you can't you can't find people who are in the market for a house. You can't find people who um, have a certain income level and stuff. You're just plastering this up, and I think the reason a lot of people do billboards, it's a vanity thing. Like they like the idea of people driving by and it's like, oh, there's a billboard. I've made it. Um, so I'm not saying that's you, Picnic City. I'm just saying I think that's um, kind of the draw. And it's basically it's we our technology is better now and we're much better off pinpointing who sees our ads because you're um, hold on. Picnic City, I, I own an event rental company. So yeah, you can target people who are event planners or people who are having a wedding coming up or a birthday coming up, whatever that is. Much smarter to advertise that way, right? All right, so hopefully that, hopefully I've successfully steered you away from the billboard route because I think those are really expensive too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Troy's got another question. What about hosting? Do you get your clients to purchase their own and what do you recommend specifically for local businesses? Um, so for, I just want to say, first of all, from not like, I, I'm not going to be doing a lot of questions targeting other web strategists and web developers and dealing with their clients. Um, that's kind of not the, 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 um, what I'm trying to accomplish here today. It's mostly to kind of answer people's questions for, you know, your own small businesses. So I'll answer this one though. Um, but yeah, I basically get my clients to get their own hosting because that I don't want to have to manage all their hosting. I know a lot of web pros, um, what they'll do is they'll basically get a, a big hosting plan and then get all their clients on it and keep doing that recurring revenue model of charging them for their hosting. But I don't really want to be my client's landlord over time, you know, because then if they don't make payments, then I become the angry landlord and I have to like go chase money. I don't, I don't really want to do that for the money involved. It's, it's a pretty low price point for that kind of stress. That's my take on it. All right. So next one is from Mental Mary. In addition to Pam's question, I'm curious if you've seen more success with recorded versus live videos. So that's a weird thing too, because I like doing these live videos to basically bond with people who've already found me and who like my other videos. Live videos are not good for getting new people like we talked about, right? Very few people will find me through this video, but for the people who have already been watching my videos, this is a great way for us to get to know each other better, right? So um, they have, d each has different purposes. I have some videos that get a lot of views, like specifically my, uh, for whatever reason, my Facebook related videos get a lot of traffic. So people find me through that, then they'll, some will watch some of my other videos and then, you know, they'll watch this one where we get to be more one-on-one, -on -one, which is cool. So it's not like I, um, you know, so success is kind of a, 
it's a loaded term, right? I would say both can be successful, one to get you more people and the other to get you closer to those people. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question. All right, next question from Enact Theater and Schools. Are video links better posted on website or in a Facebook group? Are video links better posted on a website or in a Facebook group? Um, I think you're just asking, or is it better to put your videos on your website or in a Facebook group? And my answer would be both, because if you do a Facebook Live or a YouTube video, any, any kind of video you do, you can basically download it. You know, this live video I'm doing right now, if I wanted to after, I can download it and then I can put it, embed it on my website or um, with YouTube, you basically don't have to do that because you can just link to it and embed it. But if it's a Facebook video, then you have to download it because I don't think Facebook has that functionality of letting you embed one of their videos. So I say do both. I think whenever you have content that lives on another platform like YouTube, like Facebook, it's always good to have it also live on your website. Have all, Control all your content in one place, right? That, that way I can send people back to my website and say, hey, that's where you'll find all my podcast episodes. That's where you'll find all my videos. So it's like a one-stop shop for everybody to get all the good stuff, right? Okay, uh, next one from Gamers Truck. What video software editor, editor do you use? I don't do that. I have a um, I have an editor that does it for me. I think she just uses you know, Premiere Pro or whatever the, the standard ones are. All right, next one from Revazio Conservadora. Hey Wes, can you give an insight about how long for a new website and his best efforts to reach levels of 10 in domain authority and 30, a benchmark? Unfortunately, I can't tell you that. I wish I had those answers. Because um, I think domain authority is one of those things that it's, it's like a, um, it is just that it's like a benchmark, but it's not official. Like Google doesn't have domain authority. It's basically, it was, it's a score invented by Moz, it used to be SEO Moz. It's basically putting together all the different, how many backlinks do you have? How long have you been in business? How many pages do you have? All that stuff to say, to give you a score of how well you're likely to rank. So um, I don't know if I had to say, because I think m most websites start at, you know, zero or one. And then the thing to know about domain authority, it's like exponentially harder. So to get from zero to 10, is easier than to get from 10 to 20. And it gets harder and harder and harder as you go on. So if you have like a domain authority of 30 as a small business, that's really good. Um, and then you get to 50 and you're really good. So um, I would say domain level 10, maybe a year, 30, maybe three years, if I had to guess. It's, it's really hard to say though. All right, next question. Oh, and by the way, we're almost out of questions here, so get yours in. We wanna keep this going, so. Uh, if you have anything about your website or digital marketing, any of that stuff that I talk about on my channel, it's all fair game. So uh, let's see here. We got from Patrick Hall. Should all backlinks be able to be found on Ubersuggest? Thanks. Um, should they, are you saying, because like a lot of times there's like the, key, hold on just a second. Mouth's drying out. Sorry. Um, so a lot of these programs that try to find backlinks won't find everything. For one reason or another, a lot of links are just not findable yet by whatever program you're using. And Uber suggests, as much as I like it, it's a free solution. Um, it's not as powerful as some of the others out there, but it's a, it's a give and take. Oh. Hold up. There we go. I lost my camera there for a sec. Um, it's a give and take because... Um, you know, some of the, the the more robust software programs, A, they're really hard to use. Like you'd be look, it's like looking at the human brain when you look at it, it's difficult. And then they're really expensive too. They're like, some of them are like over a hundred bucks a month. So, I mean, that's not going to show all backlinks in general, no, but um, it'll, it'll give you a good indication. And at least you can see how many you have versus your competitors, because it's probably missing some on both. So there's no real great answer that I can give you, unfortunately. But yeah, nothing's ever going to be found across the board, even with the expensive ones. All right. Brian Gallardo says, what's your opinion on Hoth for link building? I like the Hoth. You probably saw my mug here and that may, maybe made you, uh, you know, sprung you to the question. But basically, 
the Hoth is who I always recommend to all my clients. Um, I used to do some SEO myself. I used to white label it out and the Hoth is who I would use. But for now, I literally just pass my clients along to the Hoth. And because I like them because it's all transparent about what it is they're doing. They show you a report every month. You see exactly what links you paid for and where they where, where they are. Um, a lot of times if you just hire more of a freelance SEO person, and this is not across the board, some are better than others, just like some companies like the Hoth are better than others. But I like the Hoth and I like, um, they, they will do a free consultation with you over the phone just to kind of hear what you need. And I've actually had several cases where I had talked myself into like an expensive plan, like I'm going to do this. And I get on the phone with them and they're like, Wes, we don't think you need that. You probably need this one instead. So it's not like they're always trying to upsell you, which is, that's a nice thing. So, and their, their backlinks are good. Um, I have noticed in a few times where um, some of the backlinks will go away after a while, but the good news with them, I think they kind of guarantee those links. So if you get in touch with them, you, let's say you paid for a really expensive link with them and you see it's gone a month later or a year later, reach out to them and say, Hey, that link's gone. And they'll, they'll do so they'll, they'll either replace it with a different one or maybe money back. I don't know, but give them a shot. I like them. All right. Next one is from C Quinn. Have heard as a web designer developer, it's best to specialize in a niche. Is this good advice? Yeah, I would definitely always recommend working in a niche. Otherwise you're competing against everybody. And I tell this, let's, let's even break this out of the web designer developer thing. Every time I ha have a discovery session with a new client, I have to ask them, and this is small businesses of all types, right? Who is your audience? Who are you for? And the biggest red flag is when people say everybody. We're for everybody. We can help everybody. It's like, well, maybe you can help everybody, but the more you niche down into something specific, the and I get it, the, the thinking is if I niche down, um, people are going to, I'm going to be leaving money on the table, right? I, now I there's all these other people that I can't help, but the people who you can help and who you specialize in are going to be willing to pay so much more because you are, you know, you specialize in their situation. It's why doctors, like why specialist doctors make so much more than general practitioners because they're an expert in one thing. Think about it in your case. Think about if you were going to be hiring a web web designer, right? Or a web strategist, whatever. And you found me and I just said, I design, I do websites for all businesses, anything, you name it, I will do it for you. But now imagine you are a lawn care company and you found a company that, that does websites for lawn care companies. We do that all day long. We know it works. We know uh, how to convert the, the, that traffic into paying customers for the lawn care industry. You're going to be willing to pay so much more for that person, right? Because they bring with them that kind of experience that's going to put more money in your pocket. So hopefully that made sense. All right. Another one from Picnic City. How to, how to spend $1,000 in smart advertising during our current pandemic situation for an event rental company. Thanks in advance. So yeah, you're in a tricky uh, spot right now because you're obviously you're one of those uh, hardest hit probably with all this right now. So what I would do is focus on building up your email list. So while people are not having events right now, like I don't know if you maybe, let's say you specialize in weddings. Um, people know they're not getting married right now and they've probably had to postpone their wedding or reschedule it or whatever, but it's not off their plate in their mind. Like they, it's not like, Oh, we're not getting, going to get married now. They're just going to put it off. So what can you teach them in a video series or in a, a cheat sheet or a swipe file or anything like that, that will help them get things started even now? Like, you know, what, think about the that information you can give to them, come up with that lead magnet, and then that's what you put your advertising money behind. Because that's the other thing too. I never recommend using Facebook ads or any or Instagram ads to sell your core service. Hardly ever, the only time I recommend doing that is if you're like advertising in a special offer of some kind, like a you know free piece of cheesecake if you come in to our restaurant you know this week kind of thing. Other than that, what you don't want to do is say, hey, we're an event rental company. 
we're really good. Like that just doesn't do it. So what you want to do instead is use those to get people on your email list where now you've got them and then you can send out that helpful content every week. So lead magnet style, um, do a lead ad or just getting them back to the landing page where they can opt in the old fashioned way. All right. Um, from web design life, what would you recommend for my small business, which is a web design company, um, Google pay per click or Facebook ads to get best results? Um, yeah, so just goes back to what I was just saying. So basically, uh, well, okay, yeah, for a web design company, anything where people are actually searching for what you do, that's when Google ads can be really good. Uh, assuming, of course, that the competition level isn't super high and your pay-per-click uh, cost isn't crazy either. So when, you, when you're doing Google Ads, you can obviously advertise your service because people are searching for you. Um, if you're doing Facebook Ads, uh, you know, you got to target the right people. You got to target, you know, marketing managers, small business owners, that kind of thing. And I would definitely do with the lead magnet route there, teaching them how to kind of get started with uh, with their DIY website or something. And a lot of those people will kind of read your stuff and think, hey, I want this guy to do it for me rather than me doing it myself. So I think I would definitely go the, the pay-per-click route with Google because a lot of people are looking and you can even do YouTube ads with that. You know, you can find people who are um, in market for a website company. That's one of the ways you can target with YouTube ads. So if you can put together a really cool little video that's a great way to do it too. And the other thing I love, oh, I, I don't know if you've seen any, uh, any of my videos where I talk about digital marketing strategies for 2020, but one of the things I love now is um, uh, Spotify ads for local businesses. They're amazing. You can reach people for about a penny a listen, um, which is just way less than anything on Facebook or or YouTube or Instagram right now. So try it. It's like a 30-second ad where they can't skip it, and there's a little like, you know, it'll pop up as a little ad on their screen that they can tap and go right to your website. So I've, I've actually got a video on that coming up pretty soon. So uh, stay tuned for that. OK, and we are getting uh, down to our last couple of questions here, too. So if you want me to answer yours, better put it in the chat. All right. So Jill Lohr, A. Sorry, I'm, to I'm not doing very well with names today. I'm butchering everything. How do you manage a t TikTok content? If you have multiple, okay, right there. I don't know TikTok whatsoever. I'm sorry, but um, yeah, sorry about that. I don't, I don't know TikTok advertising, but one of my colleagues, uh, uh, totally blanking on his name. He's also on YouTube. Uh, I'll, I'll think of it. But he's, he does a lot of Instagram stuff, and he's also a big believer in TikTok as an advertising platform. So. Um, Point being, there are better people than me to ask for that, unfortunately. Sorry. All right, next from Cheryl Miller. My target market is mainly on LinkedIn. Will you be doing any content for LinkedIn lead gen? Do you advise paid ads or one-on-one -on -one search and connect? Yeah, so I recently had someone on my podcast. Um, that episode hasn't come out yet, but basically a LinkedIn expert, how to do you know client generation using LinkedIn. And I asked him about LinkedIn ads. And he basically said it's like the biggest waste of money there is. So that's like the, the ads that you think of that pop up through the feed. I do think there is some good side to actually paying to connect with people on LinkedIn, but um, which is basically it's a different kind of ad. It's like I think they call it sponsored mail where you can just send messages to people who you haven't necessarily connected with based on their job title or their city, whatever like that. So um but I think just good old fashioned searching for the right people and connecting with them is the better play here, but you have to do it smart. So what I mean by that, I think a lot of us have run into the thing on LinkedIn. Tell me if you have, I think it's so annoying where they add you on LinkedIn, you accept it. And then as soon as you accept it, they hit you up with like, Hey, I'd love to get on the phone with you to see what we can do for you this week. I pretty much get rid of them right away. Like that's not the way to do it. The way to do it, would be to actually, you know, add them as a connection and then just drop them a line and say, hey, great to connect. Let me know if you need anything. And then here's where it doesn't end with just reaching out. What I would recommend is really make use of content marketing here. 
do quick videos, do live videos. That's probably the best thing you can do. And it does not have to be fancy. It can be just with your webcam. Go on maybe twice a week live, just to have a quick you know, one minute thing to talk about, and then maybe answering people's questions as you go. Or if you don't wanna do live, you can do a pre-recorded video, or you can even just do articles. But basically the point being, you're finding all the right people, you're adding them as connections, then they're seeing your helpful expert content as you, they go through your feed, and then they'll remember, you know, not everybody's gonna call you at that point, but a certain percentage of them will. So I think that's the best way um, of operating in LinkedIn these days. All right, next question from another one from Ravazio. Uh, hey Wes, can you give an insight about how long for a new, oh, we've already, oh, never mind. We've already done that one. All right, next one is from Joanne Corley Schwartzkopf. Are you seeing anything interesting in your Facebook advertising of late that is of note? Um, you know, I haven't really been running at Facebook ads lately. Um, I did just start a new YouTube ad, so you guys will probably start seeing that for my for my master class uh, that's being advertised right there. So yeah, basically what I've done in my I've made a YouTube ad that's targeting anyone who's seen any of my videos to get them to sign up for my master class. So but that doesn't answer your question. That's not Facebook related. Um, yeah, there's nothing that new. Um, I do list, just, I haven't run a lot of Facebook ads lately, but I do keep up to date with everything. I listen to podcasts. I just kind of, you know, listen to the experts and make sure I always know the, the latest thing. But um, yeah, it's basically nothing's changed lately that I know of. So um, yeah, that's, so I've got no more questions right now. Let's go in the chat and see what people are saying. Um, Oh, I've got one here. I guess we just haven't had any added to my document. I see one from the JLORA again. Can you create your own Spotify playlist as a brand? I think you probably can. Um, I don't know why you couldn't. Uh, I don't know what you'd be putting, like there's probably a lot of creative ways of doing that. You know, like if you're a, a cooking company or like a catering, I don't know, like a restaurant, maybe it's like you put together a cooking playlist or, um, you know, or if you have a podcast, you could put together different playlists based on um, what people's goals are. So there's lots of ways you can do it. I don't, I, I'm not sure that the brand is ever front facing though, if that makes sense. Like I don't, I'm trying to think when I'm on Spotify, I see playlists, but I don't know that I see like who made the playlist because to tell you the truth, like I don't really listen to Spotify very much, um, except for if I, there's a specific song I am dying to hear. That's basically how I use it. So, um, all right. I'm in Camille. I don't know if you're keeping adding questions in here. Um, but yeah, I'm seeing a few more in the chat. Uh, Cheryl Miller says, is the live webinar dead as a sales opportunity? Is it oversaturated? Yeah. So what, what you're, what Cheryl is referring to here is, Basically, webinars, you know, it's a great, it's a, it's a funnel. It's getting people into a webinar um, to teach them something and then to sell them something after. And a lot of, I think you're, and you use live in quotes, and I think that means uh, what a lot of people do is because they know that live webinars tend to convert better than pre recorded webinars. So there's software out there called EverWebinar. Guilty of using this in the past. I have to own that. Um, where you can basically, Fake it. You know, you do a pre recorded webinar and then you have this fake chat roll on the side. So it looks like there's people in there and it looks like there's people saying stuff. Um, and to be fair, it's usually not like you typing it all in yourself. It's usually like it just kind of logs everything anyone types in overall because it's usually on demand more or less. So you watch it now, someone else watches it a half hour from now, and all your comments, everyone's comments just goes into that big. Uh, comment pool and it looks like people are really there live and it has like a fake number count of how many people are here in the room. So that is definitely going away. People are way too smart for that now and people can tell. People can tell if it's live because they're interacting with real people in the room. They're saying your name, right? They're mentioning, you know, what day it is or they're mentioning a current event, that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, live web, I would say live webinars, if they're really live, no, that's, th those are totally fine. And there's a lot of value in a live webinar because of the Q&A session in the end. Um, there are a lot of work and it's, it's a lot of doing the same thing over and over again. I like automated webinars. 
Uh, but yeah, the, the whole idea of faking the live webinar, I would say that's dead. I would say don't do that. It's just not a lot of, um, there's not, it's kind of out of integrity, I think, and people are, are catching on. And you don't want to lose people's confidence. That's the main thing. All right. Um, next one from Ash. Hi, Wes. What are meta tags and how do you create custom tags for your site? Meta tags are basically, it's an SEO thing. It's um, anything, any the meta description for your website. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of meta tags. There's a lot, you can put meta tags on images or just on the site in general to tell Google what your page is about. So if you're interested in how to create them, uh, you're going to want to install Rank Math on your WordPress site. And then for every picture, you add alt text. That's a meta tag for that. And you add the description, which is the meta text for, you know, like when you're in a Google search, um, or when you do Google searches, you see the every, there's all the listings with the headline and a description. So the headline and the description are both, uh, both meta tags, uh, different ones. So uh, anyway, there, it's a big question, Ash, but that's, that's the general answer. All right. Next one is from Ver Veronica Valencia. Was it scary to put your first video on YouTube? Probably. I'll tell you, it was a lot scarier to do my first live. Um, that was definitely like had to, you know, breathe first, had to get kind of get pumped up. And uh, so I did a few. Um, this was the first one that I actually had that I knew I was going to be doing ahead of time. And then I decided like I wanted I want to do a few just to kind of warm up. And then when the whole lockdown thing happened, I thought, you know, this is a good time to, and I gave myself no time to think about it. I'm like, I'm going to go live in a few minutes. And I just did it. So, you know, and I, I actually, I was able to get my like kind of sea legs under me because I have my, I have my, my paid course, which is called the profitable website launch pad. Um, that's on westmcdowell.com if you're interested in checking it out. Um, so my, my paid students, we have a Facebook group and I'm in there. Shout out to any of you guys. If you're in here today, let me know if you're here. Um, so as they know, we do a live, uh, Q and a session on Facebook every week inside the group where I can answer their questions as they're working through the program of getting their website built. Um, so I was able to do that with a small group of people, you know, just a few, it started off really small and that was, it was easier for me to wrap my mind around having like four people watching versus, you know, I don't know how many people are in here right now, but, um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a mind game knowing a lot of people are watching who you don't know. I mean, in terms of just uploading my first video, I don't know. I don't think I was that, I'm, I'm much more nervous about going back and watching that first video. <laughs> I'm sure it's really bad, but, um, yeah, but I would say, I would guess you're asking because maybe you're nervous about doing it. Don't be, you need to do it. If you have something that people need to know, um, you're doing them a disservice by not giving them your expertise, right? So just put it up there and you know, it'll be fine knowing your first few videos are probably going to suck. And you just got to, you, you got to embrace that fact. I know mine did. I know just about everybody's first videos suck, but it's reps. You get better. You do it over and over again. You don't let it bother you because you're never going to get good if you don't practice, right? All right. Let's see. So from Cheryl Miller, do viral giveaways work for email lead gen? Yeah. So viral giveaways, um, I assume what you're talking about is like giving away something for free. That can work, but you got to be careful. What a lot of people do is they'll do like, you know, giving away an iPad or giving away an Amazon gift card for, you know, enter for your chance to win that. The problem with that is you're going to get a bunch of people who just want free stuff and you're not going to get people who are actually interested in what you do. So what I say, if you're going to do something as a giveaway, make it something that you offer so that you know they're, if, if they don't want that thing that you can offer them, they're not your customer anyway, and you don't want them on your list because you pay for everyone on your list and you don't want that. So uh, like for instance, what I did, a giveaway I did on my podcast, because was the podcast was new and the way you get your podcast listened to is by getting ratings and reviews. So what I said was, do it, give this show a rating and review, screenshot it, send it to me to enter for your chance to win a half hour uh, coaching call between you and me. That way, you know, it, it basically enticed people to do it. But if I were to say, do it for an Amazon gift card, you know, it's, I mean, but I would argue that those people are already listening to the show. So they hadn't, 
they were interested in the content, but um, if it's just kind of outward facing on your website, make sure it's something you're giving away that you are giving them, not that it's from Amazon or from Apple. That's not gonna do you much good, so. Uh, but it can work. All right, from Tom Wolf. I'm opening a new business in a small town of 5,000 people. I'm planning to run Facebook ads to drive people to my website landing pages. Should I try to saturate the market by income dem demographics? This is a great question, Tom. So if, when you're in a small town of 5,000 people and you're doing Facebook ads, here's what I want you to do. Throw out all, everyone will always tell you to run conversion ads. That is always, that is, that's very good advice, but if you're reaching a really small group of people, just do um, optimize it for reach. That's it, because if you've got a town of 5,000 people and you're optimizing for conversions, 25 people will find that ad. So um, you want to just blanket. You want to make sure everybody gets it. Um, and you're, it'll be cheap because it's only for 5,000 people. And in fact, it's actually, it's actually kind of hard to run Facebook ads with that few people. But um, the only way to really do it is to just go for reach. That way they show it to everybody in that town. You can also do, you know, age stuff too. Like if you definitely don't want anyone under 18, um, pay you know, you don't want to pay for those people watching your ad, then do that. But that's about all I would do. Because actually income demographics are not what they used to be. It's a little bit of a workaround. Like they don't really, um, all they can really do is show your ad. Yeah, this wouldn't work for you at all because they used to be able to show you like, okay, I'm going to show my ad to people who are in the top 1% of earners in the country. All they can do now is say, let's say you wanted to reach that top 1%. What they can do now is I want to reach the top 1% of U.S. zip codes that are the highest uh, money-making zip codes. So it's a little, it wouldn't work in your case, right? Because you're it's in your town anyway. All right. Uh, from T-Face, what software are you using right now for this live session? It's called Ecamm. Uh, Ecamm, and I'm using my Canon M350, um, just plugged into an HDMI. And yeah, it's my first time using it. And I, yeah, I think it's going pretty well so far. I think it looks much better than it does on a webcam. So, all right. Uh, from Emily Sype, another one from Emily. Thoughts on separate landing pages for email offer campaigns versus linking directly to an offers page on your website. Let me read that again. Thoughts on separate landing pages for email offer campaigns versus linking directly to offers page. Oh, so basically you're saying with your, your running email campaigns, yeah, you want to get people from your email to the page they want to be on. So the way you do this is, let's say you've got different lead magnets. Like for me, I've got a lead magnet about Facebook ads. I've got one about um, SEO. I've got one about uh, local SEO. So let's just put those in three, three buckets. And let's say I had three different paid offerings for each of those things. So based on what you opted in for, you're tagged with my email software, and now I'm gonna send you emails. Um, uh, the, the local SEO people are gonna get that series of emails, and it'll link to an offer that I have for them on that specific page. I wouldn't just send them to my homepage because then they have to wander around on their own. So much better to always get people to the page where they're most likely to convert. So hopefully that's what you asked. All right, uh, from Veronica Valencia, for the images on the website, how should we structure what we add as a tag? Example, pictures of shoes, should I tag it shoes or business name and shoes? Thank you. Yeah, so what you're referencing are alt tags. So what I like to do here is figure out what your main keywords are for any given page. Um, so let's say you had a women's shoes page on your website. I don't really talk about e-commerce much, but let's just go with that example. So if, you're, if the main keyword you're going for is women's shoes, you would want your, your main image on that page should be tagged women's shoes but you don't want to tag multiple images with the same tag. So then another one should be, um, you know, business name, women's shoes or women's shoes in city name, whatever. But then once you go through the, the, the keywords, then just start tagging them uh, in a way that makes sense. It actually describes the picture. That's my best advice, but just don't do any repeats and make sure you're using your keywords that you're trying to actually rank for, including local keywords. All right, from Deborah Chin. I have a cycling tour company in Jamaica. Nice. 
I want to put video in my landing pages. How long should the video be to be effective? Um, yeah, so uh, anytime you're talking about website video, especially for something like that, um, you're not trying to sell them on like a expensive software, right? You want to give them a sense of what it is you do. So I'd say shoot for a minute, two minutes maybe, where you're basically showing a lot of beauty shots of where you'll be writing. Um, yeah, don't just have you behind a desk. If, if it's for a tour company, it's got to be out in the wild, sh you know, shooting maybe a GoPro on someone's helmet, showing like exactly what they'll see with a little voiceover telling you about your benefits. That would be probably the best way to go. All right. From Cheryl, do you have a book? And if so, do you have any digital marketing tips? Um, do I have a book? I don't have a, have a book. I mean, I have a few uh, e-books that I, that I still sell on Amazon, but they're mostly geared toward graphic designers. They're not really what I talk about anymore. Uh, do you have any digital marketing tips? Um, I assume, are you asking about for selling a book? Cheryl, if you want to clarify that question, and then Camille, if you can put it in here, um, I'll answer that. But I don't know if you're asking if, if you're asking a digital marketing tips for a book or just in general. Because if you're asking in general, I have um, several videos. I've got one of digital marketing secrets for 2020, something like that. Um, so I would just watch that video. Uh, from Sky, Ch oh, Camille saying yes. She's asking about book marketing. Okay, hold on. For ebooks, yeah. Um, for marketing for an ebook, what I would, yeah, I would just I would do uh, I would try probably Instagram ads, Instagram story ads are probably a great thing to do. So um, do like you can do an Instagram story carousel ad, you know, because when you're doing stories, you can swipe through. You know, you can tap and it's like, you'll see the next thing. Uh, you can do a few different screens. So the first one might be the cover of the book with a few like animated GIFs to attract attention to it. Then the next one might be like a screenshot of a review it got. And then the third one might be uh, just like a, like a little quote from it, like the, the best piece of advice in the book. And then just have a swipe up, people swipe up to get it. So, but you have to ask yourself then, how expensive the book is. This is where digital marketing gets tricky. If you're charging like $2 for this ebook on Amazon, you're going to have a very hard time making that profitable. But if it's an ebook you're selling, like a more premium book you're selling yourself for like, you know, $97, then it's probably much more worth it. All right. Um, so Sky Chang says, do you recommend to host clients' websites on my server? Yeah, we've, we've covered this one. Um, it's up to you. I don't like to handle hosting. I just like to um, point them to Bluehost. That's who I used to usually use. And then we will put their site on that for them. And then it's just up to them in Bluehost. They pay them as they need to. All right. From Mary Thiel. As a real estate investor, I want to give a reward. Like if you refer someone and it closes, I'll give you $500. Facebook is so strict now. How do I solicit rewards? Um... I would say, Mary, this is the kind of thing that's better to kind of offer to your current clients. I wouldn't offer this to the masses because you're basically deputizing people to refer you if they haven't even worked with you yet. So, um, yeah, I would say like this is a re this is a, re a rewards program you offer to your clients and maybe your email list. So what I would do is I would have a lead magnet getting people on your list. Um, and there's so many cool things you can do as a realtor with, for a lead magnet, like video series of how to, you know, stage your home, like little known tips that they don't teach you on HGTV, that kind of thing. People love learning about all the nitty gritty details about buying and selling a home. There's all, that whole, you know, HGTV devoted to it. So come up with a lead magnet, then that kind of thing you're going to let people know about, you know, in your email campaigns or in person. All right. Uh, Zanet says, do you enjoy creating YouTube videos? Oh, hold on. This thing went, there we go. Do you enjoy creating YouTube videos and what made you start? Who inspired you? Yeah, I love doing YouTube. Um, turn it, I don't know if anyone, like any specific, if I had any specific inspiration, I think I started doing it, um, talking more to other web designers and just kind of giving out advice. I think it was pretty much at first an attempt to get kind of some SEO juice going to my site. So I think that's what got me started, but I love doing it. And I love kind of interacting with you guys and answering questions and uh, helping business owners 
get through it because there's so much to know. And uh, this is, yeah, I, I really enjoy it. I know not everybody does, but if you, uh, if you can stomach the idea of going on camera like every week, because you got to be consistent if you're going to do it, then I, it's, I highly recommend doing it. And my business has never been better than uh, since I've started doing it. So yeah, hopefully that answers it. Uh, from the accidental investor, do B2B sales have the same kind of funnel structure as B2C? Yeah, so if you're selling to businesses, basically they do have the same kind of structure because the reason they do, you know, this is going to sound really blowhardy, but uh, it's, it's all just human to human marketing, right? There's no such thing. People like to think, oh, business to business is different. It's a business hiring you. No, I mean, it's not like it's a building that you have to appeal to in your hiring. It's a person in that company whose job is on the line, who needs to look good in front of their boss when they're hiring and, you know, uh, uh, buying things for their office and do, making these choices. So it's still appealing to a person. So lead magnets are still key. Email lists are still key. All those things still work. The only difference being really in the funnel is a lot of times the person who first finds you is not the ultimate decision maker, in which case a lot of times there's a, there's a really good lead magnet type that I like for B2B, which is um, basically a guide, how to talk your boss into this, how to explain this to your boss in a way to get sign off on it. Like um, I, I know from my, my own experience as a web strategist, a lot of times I'd have the marketing manager contact me and we'd do discovery then it would become time for them to hire or not hire me. And guess what? The, the boss who's writing the checks was not in the discovery meetings and really wasn't privy to like all the work we were doing and how thorough my process was. So then the marketing manager now has to sell me to their boss, which wasn't working very well. So I kind of had to step in and help that person sell me to their boss. So um, that's an that's an interesting kind of lead magnet to think about if you're B2B. Um, next one for Mental Mary. What are your thoughts regarding blogging on websites versus posting articles on Facebook or LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, so again, anything that you do around the web should also live on your site, except for you don't want duplicate content. So what I would do is, you know, I would do the full blog post on your own site and then write an alternate short version on LinkedIn as its own thing, you know, not using the same words. It's just kind of a teaser for it possibly. And then say, if you want to read the full article, click through to my website, that kind of thing. That's, that's how I would handle that. All right. Uh, from Raji. Hi, Wes. Can you do a video on affiliate marketing? Uh, no, that's not a topic I'm going to be covering. Um, affiliate market, there's a, there's plenty of people who do that. I specialize in small business owners, service business owners, um, you know, making money while you sleep and, uh, you know, affiliate marketing and stuff. It's just, it's, that's not really my, what I'm all about. So sorry about that, Raji. Uh, let's see, no more questions on this, but let's see what we've got here in the chat. Um, let's see. Sorry, guys, this is riveting. I'm just trying to... Camille, are there any more questions? Oh, we've got one here. Okay. From Callum Tabraham. I've recently started growing my mailing list, offering free music production tips and tricks. And at 2,000 so far, uh, is there a number I should aim for before I try to generate sales? No, I'm honestly... 2,000 on your mailing list is good. Um, and... I heard this advice a while back. I don't remember from who, but it's really it really stuck with me. When your list is small, you're in a unique position to really give your that list a lot of love and a lot of attention. So go with it. You know, go with it. And by the way, two thousand is not that small of a list. I know people who've made a lot of money with, you know, people with less than five hundred people on their list as long as they're the right people. So start marketing, start doing it, and then really lean into the fact that it's a smaller list, ask them questions in your email, say, hey, what can I help you with today? And then answer their questions and really build up that community and that tribe with that smaller list. And they're gonna be, they're gonna love you for it and they're gonna be much more likely to you know, recommend you to their friends 
and people uh, who could also get on your list. So, all right, so from Kelly Schaefer, how much do you recommend spending on a Facebook ad to reach a US audience? In my case, artists who want to list their art online. Um, how much do you recommend spending on a Facebook ad? So that's a tough question. Um, I generally recommend about a thousand bucks a month for Facebook ads. Um, you can go lower than that. Where I find that most people have, you know, their, their ads don't perform well is based on not putting enough behind it. And I know it's scary. It's a little bit of a leap of faith to see if an ad's gonna work. And what people do is they do it and they see their ads aren't getting where they want it to be in a few, within a few days and they just pull the ad and they think that was a waste. But Facebook needs time to optimize and all that stuff. So I would, I'd say try a month, do a few different ads, use dynamic creative if you want to, to do different versions, test out either different headlines or different images, and then see what works best. You know, so that ends up being about 30 bucks a day. That's what I would try for. And hopefully you see some good results with that. And if not, it's time. It doesn't mean Facebook ads don't work. It means maybe something's off with the targeting or maybe the ad creative itself wasn't connecting. So there's a lot of things to play with. Um, and it's, I get it. It's not cheap. It's not free. So it's a little bit of what are you willing to play around with, right? So hopefully that gets you going in the right direction. All right, from Troy, I told my clients to provide blog content to help with SEO. However, they don't know how to blog and I don't like writing content. Do you, do you recommend a way to find a good content writer? Yeah, um, there's a site called Upwork that's great for finding freelancers like that. So just go to Upwork and search for uh, content writers. And ideally, you'd probably wanna find someone in the right niche because what you don't want is just someone who's a like a gun for hire writer who is just gonna write anything. You, people can tell if an article has been written as a term paper, like researched and written versus, hey, I know what I'm talking about. Like those articles are so much more engaging when it's written by an expert who knows the topic because you can tell that someone knows versus just having research. So find someone who's in the niche, who is a good content writer, not sales copywriter. That's a different thing. All right. From Taylor Rose, I'm an experienced digital marketer, burned out on it actually. Uh, so much that I've ventured and fallen in love with web design. Would you consider web design as a new career still viable in 2020? Yeah, I mean, but I would I would go you one better and I would I would almost take out the word designer. I mean, I used to, it's one of those things where people get a connotation of web design in their mind of, oh, you make things pretty. So you're gonna have a hard time getting a lot of money for that versus like something like I'm more of a web strategist. There's design involved, but if you know uh, digital marketing, you bring that to the table. Yeah, now you, you can bring design and strategy to it, charge more money, get better results for people. So yeah, there's still a market for this. I mean, people need, they need help. They need the strategy, the backbone behind the website that's gonna get them business because the reason I'm doing this whole channel and what I do with my clients is not just about here's a website for your business. Good luck. No, it's about recent, like what is going to make this website work for your business? How are we going to get people to the website? Then how are we going to talk to them on the website to really make sure people go from a cold lead to a warmer lead and finally a paying customer. So go with that, be a web strategist, web designer, fine, but you'll always have a hard time explaining um, why, you, why you're worth a lot of money at that point. So, all right. Oh, sorry, I got to scroll back down here. Uh, from Zanet, regarding keywords and articles, does YouTube and the same content on a web blog seem to Google as if it's double content when you use the same words? I get different views. Um, keywords and articles, does YouTube... Okay, so basically you're saying... Do you, would you use the same words, the same wording on YouTube in the description and then use the same wording on your website? No, you wouldn't do that because double content, duplicate content rather, is something that Google, um, people say Google penalizes duplicate content. They don't really penalize. They just will, if they see two pages, right? Let's say you put your YouTube video and you wrote out this long description Google sees that first. Then you put that same thing on your website with the same words. Google's just gonna say, 
We've seen this before. We're not going to serve this page up as a search result. YouTube did it first. This page did it second. This one doesn't get the, the SEO love. They don't penalize you. They don't like say, oh, you know, that's a demerit on your website. They just don't show that. So use separate words. Um, generally, the description on YouTube doesn't have to be very long. Make a much more fleshed out blog post on your site and a smaller version for YouTube and you should be good to go. All right. Deborah Chin, I'm learning how to create landing pages. Can you recommend a site to practice building landing pages in a simple way? Yes, Elementor, I love it. So just get um, get WordPress, get a build of WordPress and then add Elementor, it's a free plugin. And I've got several videos, actually I've got one that shows you how to uh, do an opt-in landing page from start to finish with Elementor. I love Elementor so much, I can't even tell you. Like, I can actually, De develop my own websites now. I have a designer developer who does it for me still, but I can do it. I never used to be able to do it myself. I could design them. I couldn't code them, but Elementor is very drag and drop. And if you go to this, I keep, don't, don't know where to point. If you go to the masterclass down here, um, the, the end of it, I'm actually going to show you how you use Elementor to create your website with no coding knowledge whatsoever. So check that out if you haven't already. All right. Um, from Mary Thiel, is Instagram better than Facebook for advertising? All of a sudden, people online are pointing to Instagram. So by better, it depends on where your people are, right? So uh, Facebook owns Instagram. So you set the ads up in the same place. You set it up in Facebook Ads Manager or Business Manager. And it's really just about um, where you think people are going to convert the best. So, you know... Generally speaking, Facebook is an older demographic now than it used to be. Instagram is a little younger than Facebook is. So that's really, it depends on that. But my grandma is also on Instagram now. So, I mean, it's it's kind of all up in the air. And I'm sure TikTok, my grandma will be on TikTok any day now. So, um, you know, it's it starts off with the, the younger people and then it works its way up. So I would say there's no better what I would say, I think Instagram stories are still kind of a good opportunity right now. There's not a lot of good opportunities on Facebook and Instagram anymore because it is so saturated and it drives the price up. Don't get me wrong. I still think Facebook and Instagram are viable ways to advertise and good ways to advertise based on targeting. I'm just saying they're not super cheap anymore. But Instagram story ads can, be, can work really well. So think if there's a way you can use that to your advantage. Um, so yeah, they both work basically the same. All right. From Veronica, me again, <laughs> I, I love it. I love, I love the engagement. What's the difference between Google analytics and the analytics from the Facebook pixel? How many analytics do we need to have to have a great insight strategy? So Google analytics shows you everything that people are doing on your site. So that's, it's very like, it confuses even me sometimes. Like there's a lot of information in there. Um, it tells you what pages people go to, how long they're spending. Uh, they, they will literally show you like the whole flow of like what pages people most likely find you on, where do they go from there? And it's, it can be a lot. Uh, Facebook, the pixel, that, I mean, you can technically do like audience insights based on that, but it's basically gonna show you like broad demo demographic breakdowns and stuff. And it can show you like things they're into, like, you know, brands they follow and stuff. Cause you know, obviously Facebook knows everything about us and you know, it's basically, you can get those little insights into your customers with the Facebook pixel, but Facebook pixel is mostly, um, to be able to retarget people. So in other words, this person came to my, uh, page for this service, but they didn't buy yet. Now I'm going to send them an ad uh, to remind them of that I'm here and possibly put a testimonial in front of them so they can see, you know, the other people have had success with me, that kind of thing. So think of the Facebook pixel as more of a remarketing tool versus just a, a fact finding tool. All right. And sorry, my dog's snoring a little bit. I don't know if you can hear, <laughs> but I don't want to wake him up. All right. Um... So Raji says, is the algorithm important in Instagram? Probably. I mean, I don't really get too far into the Instagram algorithm. I don't really try to hack that. Um, there's a lot of videos about that, but I don't really know 
the nitty gritty about it. So yeah, there's, there's ways of kind of gaming that system and knowing when to post and what to post and using hashtags. That's the thing. Like if you're interested in, in Instagram stuff, hashtags is what you need to be paying attention to. So, um, basically what you want is to find people to find you now and later. And I've got a video coming up on this pretty, pretty soon, but I'll give you a little bit of a preview. So you want to find uh, hashtags that are really popular and then ones that are not so popular. Uh, so you can be found right out of the gate when you post something for the really popular ones, you'll immediately go off the, off the board, you know, very quickly, but you might get some really quick traction. And then you have medium popularity ones that keep you around a little longer. Then you have the long tail ones that not many people search for, but you'll stay up in the top for a lot longer. So that's what you want to do. Use your use the hashtags given to you. You know, you can use up to 30. Some people say they do better with like 19 hashtags. I like to use as many as I can, you know. So uh, that's what I would be focusing on. All right, from Jill Lore, is there a way to post to multiple Facebook business pages only once as opposed to going to each page to post the same content? Um, don't know about that, I'm, unfortunately. Um, I'm not really... You know, I don't really do a lot with my own Facebook business page. I know what goes into making a good one. I don't really know about doing all that stuff. I don't know that there's a way to like automate going to multiple pages at once, at least within Facebook. There's probably like a third party app that lets you do that that you have to pay for, but let me know if you find it. Another one from Sorrow Dog Training. What plugin would you suggest to use for online courses? Uh, I actually don't recommend a plugin. I recommend Kajabi. Um, you know, plugins. So basically, anyone doing an online course, you've got a few options. You can basically house the course on your own website. You own it, and there's like a plugin for membership and that stuff. Or you can pay a separate monthly fee to have it on another platform. I use Kajabi for mine. I love it. It's like a hundred bucks a month, but I make that back. I mean with one course I've, you know, paid for it three times, three or four times over. So I recommend going that route. They're optimized for video playback. They're, um, you don't have to worry about all the, the technical issues because if it's on your site and anything breaks, you're going to start getting all the emails about some things not working, passwords not working. You're much better off using someone else's infrastructure, you know? So that's what I, that's what I recommend. I also, I think I tried Teachable briefly and I didn't like it as much. Like it was just kind of harder to use, but Kajabi's great. Um, all right, I'm not seeing any more. Camille, do we have any more questions? Um, um, sorry, just kind of scrolling back through here. Camille, do we have anything? Uh, I've got one here from Tyler. I followed your Google My Business optimization videos. I moved from number 16 to number four in my area. Awesome. Um, do I need to focus on the standard SEO methods to break into the top three? Um, possibly. There's a lot of things that go into that. The first thing always being a Google, Google My Business, the map pack listings, it's always first and foremost location. So the, there's a lot of things you can do to kind of break the tie otherwise, but you know, it's all about where you are in relation to where people are searching. So, you know, the other thing you can do, yeah, I would definitely focus on SEO stuff. Backlinks are actually, people don't do a lot of talking about backlinks being important to local SEO in the map pack, but they are. You need the citations, you need the backlinks, you need a lot of just, um, you know, correlation between the content on your page and what your category is on Google My Business. You know, use the words and use your city name a lot. Do the embedded map, which you've probably already done if you followed that video. Um, so the other things you can do are, you know, other than moving your office to like the center of town or the closer to where most people are searching, um, you can actually do Google ads, like Google search ads, but you, you check a box of enabling location extension where now you can show up as an ad in the Google Map Pack. And people are much more likely to click on that ad than they are at the organic ads above it, simply because they look a lot less like ads. It's a lot more subtle. So it's a little bit of pay to play, but if it means the difference between getting uh, you know, clients or not, 
I think it's definitely something worth trying. Um, yeah, I'd have to take a look at your page to know what you need to focus on, but just make sure the content is mentioning your location, mentioning your services. Um, you know, I've gotten a lot of flack recently from several people on, from several like SEO experts on one of my more recent videos. A uh, few people have kind of taken me to task about it, where I said in that video that you can get a bump if your keywords are in your business name on Google My Business. However, I don't recommend doing it because you can get in trouble. And I, I guess some experts don't like that I even suggested that as an option, but you know, you guys are adults, you can make that choice for yourself if you wanna do that. Um, but you'll notice most people, most businesses that have the keyword kind of more or less in their business name do better than if you don't. So I only recommend doing that though if that is actually part of your business name. If it's not, you can get, Google can suspend your listing, that's all I'll say about it, but it's something that can be done for a bump. You'd probably have to make sure your business name is actually that though. Um, all right, let's see. So I keep losing my place here. Um, Wes, do you design using Elementor? Yes, I do. Have you ever tried out Gutenberg? From This is from Taylor, by the way. Um, yeah, I've tried, well, Gutenberg is basically just the it's the way you edit kind of more blog posts within WordPress. So yeah, when I add a new blog post, I use Gutenberg. It's not a replacement for Elementor, um, unless there's something I don't know about, unless Gutenberg is branched out. But uh, Elementor is a page building plugin, whereas Gutenberg is mostly just kind of a new writing framework, blogging kind of UI element within WordPress. So, but yeah, th that's kind of the standard now. Um, Callum says, best books you've read recently. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know if you can see it. It's up there. It's called They Ask, You Answer um, by, I can't see. But anyway, I don't want to get up and reveal that I'm wearing sweatpants under here. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that book is great. And it's all about content marketing. And basically the principle being making your company a content uh, content marketing company first and foremost. And the author uh, his story is he has a pool company and all, what he started doing to really stand out is he started, he knew that people were asking the same questions over and over again. Uh, you know, you know, fiberglass or concrete pools, what should I get? How big should my pool be? How small is too small? So he started making like content for all these questions he was getting and write, you know, making content for that on his website, basically attracting people to his website like crazy. So he wrote that book and I highly recommend it. I have the hard copy there, which I've never actually cracked open, but I, I got the audio book. book. Um, so if you're like me and you have more time to listen to stuff than to read stuff, it's it's an audio book on Audible. So I highly recommend that one. I loved it. Um, so Sky Chang, do you have any funnel building platform or plugin that you recommend? Okay, so I love this question. And I've been asked this one a lot in a few podcasts I've been on recently. So in terms of plug or uh, funnel, you know, just sales funnels, people tend to equate a funnel with software, you know, because of lead funnels or click funnels, sorry, lead pages or click funnels. Here's the thing. A funnel has, is, is agnostic to software. All a funnel is, is getting people who don't know you into your content to where you're educating them, they're getting to know you, and now they're turning into a warm lead and finally a paying customer. That's what a funnel is. You can do that with lead magnets, email marketing, Facebook ads, content on your website, videos, anything, podcasts. Um, so I don't like to think of it in terms of software. I actually don't, and I'm sorry if anyone here is using something like ClickFunnels or lead pages. They, they're fine, but I, I look at those platforms as kind of a um, like a workaround to having your own website, your own home on the web. Um, it basically just makes it easy to put up a landing page and call it, call it a day and integrate with all the other things. I think it's really important to have all the stuff on your website be, where you can control the conversation, something you own, something where you can you know, bring people into your world and they can opt into your, your lead magnet or lead magnets. If you have multiples, they can read your blog posts. They can contact you to work with you, that kind of thing. So I really 
try to discourage people from going the ClickFunnels route. I think it does a lot of damage to your reputation because I think it can make, if you don't have a real website website as we know it, it can make you look like a more fly-by-night operation. It's just how it is. Like People can tell if a company looks legit or if it looks like it was just kind of started up this morning. And I, have, I feel like a lot of ClickFunnels websites or ClickFunnels pages have that I made it this morning feel to them. Sorry if you disagree with that. That's just my, my take on it. But I recommend doing it all on your website, having your lead magnet opt-in on your website, then integrating it with your email marketing program like Drip or MailChimp, whatever. Emails go out and they bring people back to your site when they're ready to buy. All right, uh, from John Allen Field. Can Google My Business rank you higher in a broader geographical area when your picture is taking surrounding city, cities to where you're located? Um, there's probably a way to do that, John. I don't know exactly how to do it. And I think they, they really mostly go based on the address you put in. I think that's mostly what they do. Um, it might kind of break a tie if there's someone like you who's not doing that and you are. But let's just take the example of I'm in Chicago. You know, I'm by Wrigley Field. I'm not really in the loop. But imagine there's an accounting company right in the loop, right in the middle of downtown. And there's one in Naperville, suburb that I grew up in, that, you know, 40 minutes that way. That accounting company in Naperville is never going to be able to um, rank for Chicago accountant over the guy who's in the middle of the city. They, they're just, their algorithm is all about serving up the closest option, which is flawed. And hopefully that's going to be remedied someday because not everything, not every company matters to have it close to you, right? Like I don't care if my web designer is down the street or 500 miles away. We're living in a, and especially now, right, where everything is being done uh, over uh, online. So hopefully they'll get smarter about that. But I mean, you can try to do that, John, but I don't think it's going to matter too much. I think the better thing to do might be to try to get like, I mean, it depends how serious you are and how much your budget is. But what people have done is you can get little tiny, tiny, tiny offices in surrounding areas and have multiple locations, um, you know. You just got to play it smart. I don't know if that's in your budget or not, but um, all right. So Hat Creek Candle. I'm looking to learn more about the different retargeting options that are available for Facebook ads. Can you recommend a resource or tutorial? Yeah, um, I've actually got one of my one of my latest podcast episodes. Um, let me pull that up. Is all about um, my my best retargeting plays. Um, let me see. Let me find that. So that was from. March 30th. It's the it's called The Profitable Website is the name of the podcast and it's on March 30th and it's called My Best Facebook Retargeting Plays to Heat Up Your Prospects. Where I talk about um I don't remember if it's three I think it's three or five possibly um different Facebook retargeting ads that I personally have used and had really good success with. So I would check out that resource. All right, from Robert Bajuska. B2B service company, number one online priority. Focus on the blog, social photo posts, video marketing. Yes, video marketing is the gold standard as far as I'm concerned. Video marketing or podcast. Um, because you can make such a more such a deeper personal connection using video or the sound of your voice than a blog ever could. So if you have that kind of you know, but the, the problem is a lot of people are scared to do it, but that's also a good thing if you're not because your competition is less likely to do it and you'll come out ahead. So um, yeah, definitely get started in video marketing. Think of those questions. Remember I was bringing up um, the They Ask You Answer book. Think of the questions that they... Oop, lost the video feed again. Okay. Um, think of the questions you get asked all the time and make videos about them. Frequently asked question videos, uh, DIY videos, kind of walking people through kind of a, an easy version of what you can do and how they can do it themselves, that kind of thing. Video is a game changer. I cannot tell you how big a game changer it's been since I made a commitment to start doing this every week in my own business. So, all right. 
From Cheryl Miller, can I ask a question about pricing? I realize there's some science about prices that end in 97. Yep. Do you think it puts buyers off and makes you seem spammy or does the psychology of it still work? That's a great question, Cheryl, and I don't know. Um, my paid course, I, I use the same thing. Um, I just, I look at experts and what they're doing and I, I have to trust that it works. We may be seeing a saturation point in that. Does it look spammy? I don't know. But remember, everything used to be 99, you know, right under the threshold of 10, you know, is 9.99 versus 10 bucks. So possibly, I don't know, maybe try 98. You know, you, you stand out and you make an extra buck in your pocket. So um, I would try it. All right. Troy says, for a web designer who works for home, from home, should I still put my address on Google My Business? Yeah, that's a good question because... Google My Business lets you basically either show up as a service business that travels out or people don't come to you or they or they come to your business. So um, it's a bit of a catch-22 though. Catch-22, maybe not that, thinking of the wrong thing. But if you are serious about Google My Business and you want to show up in the map pack, you kind of have to share your address. You're just not going to show up there if you don't. They will tell you if people don't come to your actual office, you know, say that and don't have it listed, but you're never going to have as good a chance to rank. That's the, that's the truth of it. And I'll tell you a funny story. I actually had, um, my old, when I lived in California, I had my, my address listed on there and I had several times people just knocking on my apartment door <laughs> thinking that they would just drop in on me. So I don't know who goes, shows up to someone's apartment and thinks, hey, I'm just going to show up unannounced and have a quick chat, but people did, so be ready for it if you do that. <laughs> it only happened twice in a few years, though, so it's not like that common of an occurrence. Um, all right, from Cheryl, do you have any marketing tips for online coaches? Um, yeah, the definitely the content marketing is going to be your best friend. Videos, podcasts, so basically whatever it is that you coach people through, do it virtually and don't be afraid to give away your best stuff because people will still want to work with you and they will still want to pay to work with you even if you're giving them a lot of good stuff for free. So don't hold back. Teach people because the thing that's missing that they're going to pay for is the one-on-one -on -one interaction with you. So and the, you know, the basically answering their questions versus it being more general. So uh I would recommend a podcast or a video series. All right. Mary Thiel says, on Facebook business, what's the difference between of boost or promote or either worth the money um, regarding investing? So yeah, don't ever, here's the thing. So Facebook, what they like to do is they like to make kind of training wheels versions of things for people who don't know how to really do it. So basically you'll see like, pay to boost this post or promote this pin or whatever on Pinterest. Well, actually, I think that's the only way to do that. Yeah, take that back. Boosting on Facebook. Um, it's basically, it gives you very little control over who sees it. And I've never heard anyone who had good luck with it. So basically what it is, the idea is you, you're doing a blog post and you're posting it to Facebook and I'm going to put a little bit of money behind it for more people to see it. But you know, if, there, if there's no intention behind it and you can't control who sees it, meaning that granular control of like demographics, interests, that kind of thing, um, it's kind of a sucker bet. So I would definitely, I would spend a little bit of time, go on, face, go on YouTube and look up how to use the Facebook ads manager and really learn how to do it the right way. And there's also a podcast called um, The Art of Online Business by Rick Mulready. I learned almost everything I know about Facebook ads from that podcast um, he's very knowledgeable, and once you listen to enough episodes, you'll start to feel like you can do it. All right, from Jalor, what are some? I'm, and I, by the way, I hope, hope I'm pronouncing your name correct, Jalor. Um, what are some of the best or hottest trends right now in terms of digital marketing that you see for yourself right now? Yeah, I'll go back to what I was saying earlier in this broadcast. I'm loving Spotify ads right now. So what that allows you to do is create a 30 second ad. Think of like those radio ads you hear in the car when you're a kid. Um, and you, you do a 30 second ad, either you record it yourself or you upload a script and they have one of their voiceover people uh, do it for you for 
for no extra money and then upload some music and they create this ad for you 30 seconds that you can do oh, sorry I've got a radiator it's kicking on us so you're probably gonna hear some clanging apologize um, but yeah, it's, it's a really good way to target a local audience because you can do a radius around you or zip codes or whatever. If it's not a local audience, it gets a little trickier because their controls of who to show it to are a little limited. It's nothing like Facebook. You can control based on or target based on gender, age, um, location, and then very broad categories. Like if you're interested in parenting or health or, um, you know, technology, these are, they're very broad buckets. Um, but the way they calculate that is based on podcasts they've listened to on the platform. So, uh, but I, I've, I've advertised my own podcast on it. And I think I got about a hundred new listeners for 250 bucks. So do you decide for yourself if that's worth it? It was for me. Um, but it's basically a penny per listen that people that you'll pay for. And uh, just make sure you have a good call to action. Do not just say, here we are. You want to have an offer that you're giving away or possibly a lead magnet. I would love to hear from anyone who has used Spotify for a lead magnet. I would love to see how well that works out. Um, all right. Not seeing any. Camille, do we have any more questions coming in? Raji says, thanks for answering so many questions. You're welcome. And I'm probably going to, oh, we've been going for like an hour and a half here. That's great. Oh, I'm going to have to get off pretty soon because I do have a client call, coaching call coming up soon. Um, so I may be able to take one more question if I can find one. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, Patrick, oh, this is the last question I'll answer. It's from Patrick Hall. And he says, what about a PO box might be an option. So he's talking about for Google My Business in terms of getting different locations. Yeah, they don't like that. Um, I can't say for sure if they um, will penalize you or not, or if it's more of like, we may catch you. And then if we do catch you, you're penalized. I've heard of people doing, you know, like mailboxes, et cetera, kind of addresses. Again, I don't, this is definitely against what they want you to do. So you're adults. You can think about, you can weigh out the pros and cons yourself. I have heard people doing it who haven't gotten caught, but they could catch you. And you might be in your whole listing, your whole business might be demoted if that happens. So um, feel free to try that if you want to take that risk. But I would do that over a P.O. box because I think P.O. boxes, that's really easy to tell because it says P.O. box right in the address. So, but anyway, guys, that's it for today. I'm planning on doing this, you know, once every month or two. So um, love being able to interact with you guys in real time like this. Um, it's one of the, the highlights of my month. So and I hope you guys are all doing great with everything that's going on right now. And if you haven't yet, sign up for my masterclass. You'll love it. It's pe People are writing me every day an email saying how much they're getting out of it. It's going to get you. It's, oh, I should actually say what it is. It's called How to Create and Launch Your Own Profitable Client Generating Website. That's going to show you everything you need for your website, for your service business, what you can leave out how to plan it. And then finally, I'll show you uh, with Elementor how you can actually bring it to life. So again, go down to westmcdowell.com slash training to sign up for that. And um, yeah, I will see you guys all next time. All right. Bye for now. While I try to get out of here. There we go. All right. Bye for real.